Okay, well, uh, I'm going to go ahead and start recording here. Um, I don't have too many people have joined yet. Um, I mean, you know, uh, if, if, if you're struggling, you know, you have questions, you do have to, to join them. And you can always email me, but you do have to also try and make use of these sessions if you can. Um, I'm hoping that this will become a little bit more question driven from students here. Um, um, I am going to, fr from the feedback that I got, I have returned back assignment one. Um, and I had a couple things I'm going to say. I'm going to try and go through actually implementing it quickly so you can kind of see a solution. But at the same time, there's a couple of points that I can talk about, you know, about using GitHub, about using Visual Studio Code, things like that. OK, so um, as usual, I plan I'm recording this. I plan to post this video um, on our class playlist as well. So. Um, I mean, I, I did move the official time to 2 to 3 p.m., so I know some people still, because my I initially announced that at 11, and some people are still thinking at 11, but uh, but yeah, we are doing these from 2 to 3-ish in the afternoon. Um, all right, so I'm, I'm just going to jump in, so this might be rather, rel relatively quick, but, uh, but yeah, I'll have it on the video so that you can go back and replay it if you need to. So let me let me just go ahead and um, do the normal steps. I've already, you know, created my dev box. I'm not going to go over that. At this point, I assume everybody has a dev box that's working um, and that they can uh, use to do these assignments. So, you know, I haven't started assignment one yet. So I'm going to go ahead and go to that link and accept the assignment so I can create my repository for my student account here for assignment one. Uh, oh, I, I, I don't think I've got my dev box up running either. So let me go ahead and do the vagrant up to get my dev box going. Um, so, um, you know, I, I I put my repository, my dev box repository in boxes. I think yours would be repos instead, but you do have to first change to the repository directory. And then you should always use the vagrant up and vagrant down commands to start and stop that virtual dev box. Um, uh, okay, so back to accept, accept my assignment one that actually creates your repository on GitHub inside of the organization for our GitHub classrooms. Uh, and then after you do that, you should be able to get a link so you can see the repository on GitHub. Okay. Another reminder, I think I showed this before, but you know, if, if I close this page, if you need to get back to it, uh, probably the easiest way to get back to it is, is you have to find it if, if you logged into GitHub. You'll have to go to your organizations and select the uh, 2336 summer 20 because the repository that you create isn't actually owned by you. It's owned by this organization. So you have to go to this organization to find your repository. And then every one that you create for the assignments here should be under the 2336 organization, including the assignment one that I just did. Okay. Um, there should be a feedback pull request that's automatically created for you. I, I'll talk more about those later. Okay. So my main goal is just to comment on using GitHub and doing some other things. So, um, okay. My dev box should be up. So as usual, if your dev box is running on your local machine, you should be able to point a browser at the port 8080. To ring it up uh, now. I've got my. I've got a different assignment. I've got the assignment zero open here, so I, I, I need to do the steps. I'm not going to go through the steps of setting up your secure shell key, setting up your Git config. So I'm assuming that you've done those. Um, maybe another word. I'm assuming that you've got IntelliSense set up. Uh, I, I want to maybe mention about that as well here once I get the project clone. But uh, let me go ahead. Uh, I need to close my existing. Uh, folder that I have open. Um, and then let's go ahead and clone the repository so I can start on assignment one. Right. So this is somewhat of a repeat of the uh, stuff I have in the video for the practice exercise, but I'm just going to do it for assignment one here. And then and I'll try and implement um, some of the, uh, the the tasks. I don't know if I'll be able to get through all of them because I, I really don't want to. I want to talk a little bit about assignment two here. Or see if we can get some people to join and ask some questions. So um, some people were having problems which with um, cloning the the correct uh, key, the, the the correct URL. So when you do that, uh, some people were cloning the HTTPS. I, I I think it should come up by default with the SSH URL. 
Uh, but yeah, anyway, so make certain that you do clone from the SSH URL. You probably can't clone from the HTTP one that because these repositories really aren't, um, they aren't um, uh, globally visible. So, so um, um, you can't really clone from HTTP, you have to use SSH. You wanna use that anyway so that you can write and push commits to your repository. So, so, anyway, so I'll copy the URL and um, I usually just use the um, you know revision control, the source control, and the clone repository. Just paste that in there. If you get an error when you do this, uh, a very common error that people are having is they don't have their SSH keys copied to GitHub. So um, if, if you clone, uh, and I'm going to select sync as usual to clone my my um, to create a copy of my repository to the sync subdirectory. So I'm gonna have a, my, my second assignment will be assignment zero one here, I'll select that. So if you get an error here though, the number one thing to do is to check that you've got your SSH key correctly set up from your local dev box into GitHub. Um, and yes, I would like to open, that's that's like opening my folder. If again, you know, if, if you're starting, like if I, if I log out and start up, um, let me close that folder again there. So, you know, if I, if I log out um, and I want to work on assignment one, or if I would go back and work on an uh, old assignment, like assignment zero, you can always um, um, open the folder. Um, so if I've, already, if I've already cloned it, if I've got an existing folder created as a repository, I can, you know, open my folder. Uh, here, you know, um, for some reason, it started me up in my .ssh directory, I need to navigate up. So the two dots mean go to the parent and then find it, it's in sync. Um, and we, we wanna work on assignment one. So I wanna open that back up there. Okay. All right. Um, so for all these assignments, there is a checklist um, so you should go through this every time until you get used to the, the general workflow. Okay, so I did step one. I accepted the invitation, which created my repository on GitHub, which is where I'm, what I'm looking at right now. I've done step two. I successfully cloned my assignment one to my dev box using the SSH URL. So, so you do need to configure your project. Uh, each project you'll have to configure. Um, and the only way to do that is from the command line. So I'll have to go open a terminal. Um, new terminal, and that is dot slash configure. So I know people aren't used, you know, that this is learning, you know, so I know people haven't used, the, a lot of people haven't used terminals or command lines. So it's dot slash configure, okay? So uh, real quickly, you know, the, learning how to do stuff from the command line is a good thing. Um, this is actually a Linux environment. So you've got something, if you wanna go find a tutorial about doing Linux command line stuff, that would be a good thing to do if you have time or after this class is done, just to, to um, um, kind of give an explanation why you do dot slash. My current directory is sync assignment one. And if I do a directory listing LS, these are the files that are currently in there. These are the same files I can see here in my Explorer, um, except for some of these files are hidden. But yeah, we've got the doc directory, the include directory, source, so on, and then the configure. This is a, a, a script. That we have to run and I just ran it. But um, its actual location of the script is, is here. So to run a program from the command line, you actually have to specify the full path to the program. So I could specify it like that to run that configuration script. So the full path to that file is home vagrant sync assignment one configure. So these are all subdirectories and that's the file I'm trying to run, right? But as a shortcut, dot means the current directory. And so since configure is in my current directory where I'm at, I can invoke configure without having to type in the full path by saying, look in the current directory and find the file configured. All right. So that's the configure step. Um, so always make certain your project builds and runs. And maybe I should add on here, always make certain that your uh, IntelliSense is working and that your code is being formatted. So a couple of people obviously don't have things set up quite correctly. Most likely they don't have their C++ IntelliSense correctly, extension correctly installed. So um, anyway, once you do the configure, um, we can do something, let's open up the tests here. So we can check that the build system is working correctly. Control shift one should do a make clean. 
Control Shift Two should do the make all. So this will rebuild everything. Um, you shouldn't. What, all the assignments I give you, they will start off being able to be built completely from scratch. So there should be no errors here until you start adding code. So if you ever get a compile error or link error um, before you've done anything, let me know, but you shouldn't. Um, and then Control Shift 3 will actually run the test. And there's actually no tests currently um, uh, uncommented for assignment one here. So no tests actually running, right? The other thing, like I was saying, you know, make certain you've got your IntelliSense for this class. It should be the version 1.4.0, right? Make certain that um, that um, your code formatter is being run, okay? So the easiest way I can think for you to do that is type in a little code similar like this, All right? So here I typed in code, but I didn't put any indentation or spacing or anything like that, right? So if the IntelliSense is running and the code formatter is, is automatically running, every time you save your file with like a control S, it should re-indent your code, put in spaces. There should be spaces after keywords like if and fors. There should always be a space before and after um, uh, binary operators like a Boolean uh, tests or assignments. It should always indent every code indentation, indentation level by two spaces. So if I add some more lines, um, and I save it, it should re-indent those. You know, if I have a nested, if I have a nested block um, like this, um, it should, um, you know, indent this. So now, since this is a second level of, of code block, these are indented for everything inside of these curly braces, so on. Um, it should also, you know, you can check that the IntelliSense is working. So it should detect that um, uh, probably if I put this inside of some actual code, like um, let's put this inside of this test case here. And let's go ahead and uncomment this test case, first test case to get started on actually doing the assignment. So notice again here, this code isn't correctly um, indented for this test case, it's too far over. So if I hit control S here, it re-indents, so it puts everything back out to column zero, it indents this, but now also, you know, none of these variables X, Y, and Z are defined. So the IntelliSense I can tell is working because it's giving me complaints about X's, X identifiers undefined and Y and Z and so on, all right? So we're all good things to make certain that are working. Um, and if it's not working, you know, if, if your code that you commit to, to the repository for the assignments isn't being put through the code class style checker, uh, I might not look at it or I might have you redo it, uh, you know, get your code formatting correct before I will look at it. So, um, all right. Um, and uh, kind of, um, yeah, so I want to get to kind of showing uh, again how to, to make commits and get them pushed um, so let's jump ahead here. So the, the, the first task was to implement the sum of values function. So now that I've uncommented the, the first test case, this is what I normally do for the workflow. I mean, um, I, I uncomment the, the, the test case for my task one that I need to implement. Um, I go ahead and let's go back to the feedback pull requests. Um, I want to uh, associate my issue one. I haven't, oh, I haven't created my issues yet. Let me go ahead and create all my five issues here. So I'll create the, well, I'll just go ahead and create the issue for task one. So I created my task one issue. Um, and so I want to work on task one. So I'll go ahead and um, associate task one with the feedback pull requests. Um, so you should see now I've got task one on here. Um, and I'll come back to that, uh, but yeah, I'm kind of ready to work on this. So now that I've uncommented my first test case, uh, if I build, um, let me go ahead and do a clean again. So Control Shift One to clean, Control Shift Two to build. Um, it will have a compilation error because I've now uncommented code. So it will scroll back up here to the top. The, it's the when I try to compile, it's not successfully compiling. 
um, because it's, it, uh, there, there's a, a reference to trying to call the sum of values, but um, that is not defined or declared, okay? Now, um, um, so that means you know, we should start by adding in the function prototype, okay? So sum of values takes two parameters as input, so it takes an integer um, and an array of doubles, just looking, inspecting it as input, right? Um, and it's returning a result. So it's, re it's actually returning a double result. So whatever's returning for these tests, we're checking that if we try to sum up, um, you know, so if we try to sum up the values in this array of one value, it should return a result of three, right? So um, we're practicing kind of good um, project um, organization. So you should always have, uh, for like a C or C++ project, you should always have the declarations of all your functions or member functions in a header file. That's the libstats.hpp file for this assignment. So um, here, you know, we were returning the double result for our, the, the name of the function is sum of values. Um, Oh, yeah, sum of values, and it takes two parameters. It takes a regular integer as the first parameter and an array of doubles as the second parameter. Something like that, all right? So that's just the signature of the function, right? Um, but by adding the signature in here like this, um, the, you know, so we're actually including that file. So, so the way that that includes what they're what includes do in C and C plus is allows you to reuse code written by others. You know, so like you've reused code in the CMath library or things like that, or reuse your own code in your own libraries. Okay, so by including libstats, um, that has the 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 prototype or the signature for the function I want to use. So that's enough to be able to to for the compiler to know that somebody somewhere is going to implement a function called sum of values that takes two input parameters and returns a double result, right? So it's, it's enough. So if I recompile, so I do control shift two and recompile, it actually can compile um, the, the test lib stats now, right? But we're still not able to completely um, link everything together. So, so even though it compiled the file, when it tried to link it together to create the actual test executable, we had some undefined references, which should make sense if you're following me, because uh, even though we created the function prototype in our header file, we didn't actually implement. So, so we didn't actually implement, uh, you know, what the sum of values function is supposed to do. Okay, so let's go ahead and put a stub in there. So all your actual implementation should go into source files in the source subdirectory. So in this case, uh, the implementation for this function. And I usually just copy because I, I need my implementation to have exactly the same signature as the function prototype. Um, and, and I want to put my implementation at the correct place. Okay, so here is the documentation for my sum of values function. So I want to actually implement the sum of values right here, but an implementation, uh, instead of having a semicolon at the end, um, has an open and colon curly braces, and that's where we actually put the code so that whenever you call some of values, this code is what's executed uh, to implement this. Okay. Uh, but, you know, I encourage you to do incremental code development. So, all I'm really trying to do at this point, I'm just trying to get back to where so that I can successfully compile this code and run these tests. The test might not be passing yet. But I want to be able to compile it and, and actually get the test to run and then see which tests are failing so that I can start actually implementing the functionality of some of values to get these tests to pass. All right. So uh, if I didn't make a bug, if I do a, a build again, make all, it should, um, in this case, it only has to rebuild libstats, which is what it did here. Um, and But it's successfully linked things together. So we didn't get any link errors here. So it actually built the test executable and the debug executable for us now, all right? So that means that I should now be able to run my tests. Control shift three will run my tests, right? And let's scroll up here. So whenever you run your tests, um, you basically wanna go all the way up, up to the top and see the first test that's failing, right? So remember, I didn't really completely implement this. If I go back to libstats, 
uh, it's really just a stub function. Okay, so whenever you call sum of values, it just returns a result of zero as the sum, right? Um, so that's that's actually um, enough to pass this first test because we're expecting a return result zero. So if you pass in an array of, of size zero, so this means an I'm giving you an array, but there's nothing in it. So the size of the array is zero. So, so by default, it's supposed to return zero um, if you ask to sum up an array with nothing in it, right? So it actually passes, the, the first one is failing at is line 45 here, right? So, which makes sense because I'm just hard coding returning zero. Um, um, so it, it, it fails that. So we end up returning zero here when we call sum of values, but it, we're expecting it, that the sum should be three here, right? So that's why it fails here. But let's get into to GitHub then. Okay, so, um, you know, uh, a lot of people, not everybody, but a lot of people did at least get a commit or two to work, right? So now, but let me show you, just mention a few things here. So what I've done so far, um, I, I haven't completely completed task one, but I've got a good start on it. So I could make a commit right now. So it's not a bad place to make a commit at when you're learning things, just to get the hang of making commits and things. So if you go back to the source control tab, notice it, it shows that I've got three files that are modified locally, okay? So I've made changes in these files in my local repository, but these changes aren't, haven't been put into my GitHub repository yet, the, the actual global repository in GitHub. Right, um, and and this source control is very useful. Um, so, like, if I click on this, I will get a, a a difference on the file here. So, basically, if I look at my the, the the tests, the difference is is that I uncommented all the tests. So now all these tests that were commented out are now uncommented, or uh, maybe a little bit more easy to see. If I look at the diff differences that I have on libstats, click on that, you'll see that I deleted. So everything in red, I deleted. I got rid of the meta comments here. And so now I've got the function prototype in my uh, header file for libstats for the sum of values for task one. Um, and if we look at the libstats.cpp, the implementation file, you know, um, I deleted that meta comment and I've got the stub function in there, right? So it's very useful before I start creating uh, and, and making a commit here to, to check that it makes sense, you know, the, the, the modify, the changes that you have are what you want to commit here, all right? So, um, so this is a get kind of thing, but I, I need to, 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 to make a commit, I have to do it in what are known as it's kind of like stages. So I first have to actually ch stage these uh, changes as, as the first step to making a commit. Um, I could just add these files one by one to, to stage them, or if, if I want to add all these files. So, so even though I've changed the files, uh, you don't necessarily want to, 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 to stage all of them to make a commit. But in this case, I do want to, to stage all three of these files. So if I'm going to stage everything, I can do the plus here at the top. That'll stage all the files that are currently modified. So it moves them from being changes to be to being stage changes. Okay, so that's kind of a first step. And then when you're ready for that, I mean, I could go make some more changes and stage them, or um, I could go ahead and commit. So anything that's staged uh, will be part of my commit if I make a commit now. All right. Um, a word about commit messages. So I mentioned this in various places for the class, but do practice good. Um, uh, uh, industry standards for commit messages. So an industry standard for commit messages says that you should have a title for the commit message. And for our um, class, uh, try and make certain that you mention the task that this commit is related to. You need to have at least one commit for every task for the assignments. So here, uh, I haven't completed task one, but um, I created um, a uh, stub function of some of values, okay? So the first line uh, for a commit message acts as a title, and I'll show you what that means. And then you should have one or more sentences of a fuller description, okay? And, and again, you know, try and do something more than, you know, finished you know, or created stub function. I mean, try to have full English sentences here. So, um, so create function prototype and stub function of some of values um, 
this commit uh, compiles and runs tests, though uh, full implementation of some of values function is not completed yet. Right. Try and keep your lines to less than 72, less than 80 characters here. So I was actually, once I got, you know, um, you know, you can, you can resize this, but, uh, you know, that's, that's, that should be less than 80 characters there. I'm, I'm hitting return. So these are all multiple lines here. Uh, and then that's it. Uh, well, that's it to create the commit. Okay. But yeah, try and use good commit messages. Clicking the check mark here will actually do a git commit. Okay, so th this is all kind of a GUI interface over the actual uh, command line command. So you can actually do all this from the command line, but I'm just showing you using the GUI here. So we'll do that. That actually created a commit. Okay, but the commit um, is still local here. It hasn't been pushed to GitHub. All right. So one way you can, you can see that is if you look down here, it's a little subtle, but um, there's an indicator, especially here, what this is saying, the, the one with the arrow pointing up means that there's one local commit that hasn't been pushed to the GitHub, the global repository yet that, that my local repository is associated with. Okay? So, uh, and I won't actually see your work until you push it to, to GitHub, to your GitHub glass, classroom repository. So let's go ahead and push it. So by clicking that, it'll actually push the commit. And you should go back to seeing a zero down here. But more importantly, what you'll see, if you go back to your feedback call request, you'll see that now my commit, it gives it a, this kind of made up number, but this is my commit number 35B914F, which was the commit for my stub function of the sum of value, right? So notice by, by having the title, so only the title shows up by default. If you click on the three, you see the fuller description then. So that's one reason why you always have a title followed by a blank line followed by the fuller description so that you, you see kind of a, a summary or a title, but you can get more information uh, by opening that up. Um, but also those same tests that you run will get run automatically every time a commit is pushed um, to this feedback pull request. So um, it's actually finished. So when you see an X, it means it ran the, the, the classroom workflow, which are these unit tests, uh, but it didn't pass all of them. It, it's failing some of those. You, can, you, you should also always look at the details after you make a commit here. I'm gonna open that up in a new tab here. All right, but this will be running the same unit test. Okay, so uh, if you scroll back up here, you should see that that it, it successfully is able to build. Okay, so if you ever push commit that's not building, you need to immediately go back and fix that and push a new commit. Don't ever leave that your last commit that you push um, is a commit that's not building and running the test. Okay, but if it is running a test, it might be running the test but not not passing them all. Um, which is what we expect. So in fact, it, it should be running the same test. So if I go back um, and um, let me rerun my tests again, control shift three. Um, but yeah, I mean, if you see here, I'll just look at the bottom. So the result was it ran the one test case, which was failing um, and three of my tests are passing and 10, three of my actual assertions are passing and 10 are failing. So you should you, you should double check this, but you should get exactly the same result. You know, the, the same three tests are passing and the same 10 assertions or tests are failing. Um, it's not running the, 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 the task two or three or four tests yet because I haven't uncommented those yet. All right. So again, you know, this, this is covering the same kind of things I showed in the practice assignment, but I do it for assignment one here. Uh, but those are the bases. Those are a couple of things that I noticed um, that you should look out for. Um, all right. And you should you should do these tests in, incrementally and you should implement your code incrementally. So let me go ahead and try and finish off. Um, the implementation for task one. So task one. Um, is supposed to actually sum up the values, right? And since this is an array of doubles, uh, the sum should be a double that we return. 
So uh, again, I encourage you to do things incrementally, but I'm just going to go ahead and implement this. I also encourage you to comment your code. So um, so we're going to iterate over and add all values in the values array to our running sum of the values. Right. In this case, I initialize the sum to be zero. So if this loop doesn't run, we will end up returning. So I want my index to go from index zero. So if this is a normal array, the valid indexes in C++, so the, you know, part of this unit was um, you know, practicing or uh, reviewing how to use arrays in C++. So you know, if my, my size is 10, you know, that's given by the first parameter here, the valid indexes go from zero to uh, a nine, or nor the normal idiom is to go to start the index at zero. Um, and go to less than size, right? So again, if, if this the, if the size is 10, for example, uh, the valid index is zero to nine, this loop will only execute uh, for IDX being 0, 1, 2, 3, up to 9, but not, but it'll stop at 9, so it won't go to 10, which is what you want, you know, so you don't go past the end of the array here. So basically, um, uh, each iteration through this loop, I sum up, you know, so I start with 0, but, uh, you know, I sum up the first time I sum up the value from at index zero, add it to my running sum, and then the value at index one and so on. So the result the result in sum is the final summation of all values in the values array, right? Um, if the size is zero, the loop should not run any uh, iterations. So the result return would be the double 0, 0.0, which is what we want. All right. So we'll return that sum. All right. So, you know, again, that, unless I made a, a bug there, that actually should compile. So let's test that out. I should compile and actually hopefully pass all my tests uh, if I'm doing it right there. Because all these tests are basically just taking an array of values, calling the sum of values, and then expecting what the correct sum should be. So, so checking or asserting that, that, that the result returned from the function um, is what the correct result should be as a result of summing those values. Right? I'm going to go ahead and do a clean. Um, let me just clean everything up. And then so I can recompile everything from scratch. Um, and let's run our test, control shift three to run a test. Okay, so now it's actually running and all the tests are passing that I have uncommon. So I, I still got other tests that we haven't commented out yet, um, that we haven't uncommented yet, but, um, but, but the, what, the, the, what, the 13 checks that I do have uncommented are actually all passing. So that's good, all right. So let's go ahead and make another commit and push that. So that's actually a, the completion of task one here. Um, so back to our source control. So notice, I mean, I only made a change to one file this time because I, I just did the implementation. Um, so we can see the changes. So I, I, I went from um, the stub function that was already returned zero to the implementation with, you know, three or four lines of code to actually sum up those values and return them, okay? Let's go ahead and, and uh, stage that change and then commit it and push it to the repository. So here we... Um, Completed work to implement task one, the sum of values function. Here we use a simple loop over 
all indexes of the array and add them to a running sum to implement. If the array is empty, size zero, um, the loop doesn't run. So we return the default result 0, 0.0 in that case. Um, all units, I mean, uh, you probably not to be this verbose, but you know, just as an example. So um, all unit tests are passing now for task one with this commit. All right, just an example being things that you could discuss for your commit message. All right, so we made the commit. So I'll go ahead and push it. So I should now, if I go back to GitHub, um, it'll eventually show up, although I can speed the process along by doing uh, reloading here. Oh, sorry. Uh, All right, so here's my feedback pull request again. So now we see our second uh, commit that I just pushed here, the completion of task one. Um, and um, um, it, it finished running the, uh, the, the, the test workflows now, because I can see the actually didn't pass all of them. But let's examine the details. So what I expect is that it should be passing. Um, so sometimes you have to be careful here. Uh, th I think this is my old one. So yeah, I, I wasn't seeing what I was expecting. Uh, it's still showing that it's failing some of these tests on task one, but but yeah, this was one, one from nine minutes ago. So um, sometimes it takes a little bit of time to update. Uh, that still looks like the old one there. Um, oh, kind of as a hint, I mean, this this is pretty powerful stuff here. So for example, if I wanna, if I go over here and look at the the checks, these are the workflows that are, that are run automatically. But in particular, uh, if I want to, I can go back and select the particular one that I want to, to look in here. Um, so I can look at all of your commits and whether they passed or failed by going to the checks here. So um, there, there's one, and this is why it's it's important to have good commit messages with titles and things. So I can more easily see my 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 most recent one should be the last one on this list. But but yeah, so here's the one that I really want. Let me explicitly select that one. There we go. So that, that's what I was expecting to see. So, so um, we are successfully building and we're successfully run, passing all the uh, assertions test for task one. But we're not yet running or passing the test for the other task. All right. Uh, all right. Uh, one final thing on this, um, I did this on purpose, but I skipped over something. So uh, the, these these tasks, you should you should create the issues um, and look at these. Okay, uh, in particular, the, probably the most useful thing. That this is more just to get you. You know, th these are common issues are the main way that people organize uh, and keep track of work um, um, and schedule work and things on like GitHub um, and other repositories like this. Um, so probably the most useful thing I think for these issues is um, I, I try to mention these in the assignment descriptions, but I try to make it explicit, the, the requirements that I'm going to be looking at for grading. Okay, So um, the array of value should not be modified as a result of calling this function. Uh, further, you should declare the parameter correctly so that the compiler will absolutely not allow you to even consider the possibility of modifying this parameter. Um, so I guess I didn't quite make that as explicit as I thought, but that that is basically saying that the array that's passed in should be passed in as a constant parameter. Um, so by that, I mean, for example, let's close off these diffs again here. Um, 
since I didn't declare my, this is part of the material that I had for the class this week uh, in the lecture videos and things. So since I didn't declare this parameter to be a constant parameter, um, it's perfectly legal for me to do things like this, actually modify the, val the, the uh, values inside of values, which we later on need to use. So by default, these are passed in um, by reference. And if I make changes, it will actually change the values in the array here. So if I compile that, it will allow that, but we really don't want it to allow that because uh, this is supposed to be a function that only sums up the values, but doesn't actually change them. But if I compiled it, it, it would compile um, and actually run and actually run that. Um, so instead to complete those, those uh, additional um, requirements, um, what we really should have done is made this a constant parameter. Uh, now the signature of your function has to match both in the implementation and in the declaration. I need to say constant in both places here. Uh, but by making that a constant parameter, um, uh, it, it's illegal to try and do things like I just had before, like say, modify. So if, if I do that now, I should get an IntelliSense. Um, um, which isn't always easy to, to figure out what it's um, telling you here. So uh, basically values is not modifiable since we made it a constant, which is what that error message was trying to show here, but you can kind of see from the IntelliSense, it's detecting that. And, and likewise, if we did a compile, it actually won't compile anymore um, um, because we're trying to assign a value to this constant. So that should be read only, shouldn't be modifiable. So. Let's remove that and build it again. Um, and um, so here uh, I'm getting a link error. Um, I suspect though that um, um, I just need to do a clean build. So it rebuilt uh, this file here, but it didn't link everything to gray. So, so let me go ahead and do a, a clean, to make clean, let's try again. So, so yeah, but sometimes you get uh, mysterious link errors. It's, it's best to go ahead and do a clean and then do a make all. So, so that is actually working. Uh, and then and I should still be passing all my tests, control shift three, okay. So let's go ahead and, so I actually fixed that in order to, um, um, in order to um, pass all the requirements for task one. So, so make certain you look at those, uh, but let's go ahead and um, make another commit. So um, so we forgot to implement the requirements that the array is passed in as a constant parameter. So it is not modifiable uh, by the sum of values function. So we'll commit that and push it. And again, always whenever you make a commit and push, you know, go back and um, um, check that everything makes sense. Okay, so I should see I've now got my third commit for task one up there. It's still running. So until I get an extra check mark, um, it's still running those uh, tests there. Uh, but I should, you know. But when it finishes running those, I should still see it, that it's compiling, so it's successfully building and successfully passing all the assertions on the task one test. Um, all right. So uh, 
So sorry, 2.45 here, Ed, uh, so I still only have one student. Uh, any questions you want to bring up? Um, yeah, I mean, you know, I'd kind of been thinking I might show the implementation of these others, but I really want to talk about assignment two uh, for at least a little bit here. So let, let, let me just jump to that. Um, so you should be working on assignment two. The earlier you can work on stuff, the better. Let's go ahead and, and uh, get working on assignment two here. So I'll leave um, the others. So, so the other tasks, you know, you have to do similar things. The most complicated would, would have was task five. You're, um, so you're supposed to reuse pretty much all the functions for the first four tasks in task five to do the standard deviation. Um, um, but yeah, let's talk, let's, let's just get started and talk about the assignment two tasks. So as a final thing here. So uh, I'll go to assignment two as usual. I'll um, click on or go to this link in order to accept the assignment. Um, to get started on assignment two. Uh, so I want to start working on a different assignment. So let's go ahead and close off this folder. So I can clone and start working on assignment two. All right. So here's our checklist again. So I did step one, I accepted the assignment to create my GitHub repository. Uh, let's go ahead and clone the uh, SSH URL for assignment two. So this is the SSH URL for my assignment two here. Uh, I'll clone that into the sync directory as usual. And we expect to get a successful clone. Um, and we can go ahead and open it up. So we have our assignment two um, project opened up. Um, we need to configure the project as our next step. So let's open up a terminal. Uh, slash configure. Um, we want to confirm that it builds um, and IntelliSense is working and everything like that. Uh, code formatting. So I'll try control shift one to do a make clean, control shift two to do a make all, make certain everything compiles cleanly. We don't get any compile errors or link errors. Control shift three to run the tests. Um, and then I'll just do a real quick test again. That code formatting is being done. When I hit save, um, it looks like IntelliSense is detecting some things at least. Okay, so that's at a minimum. So before you start working on stuff, make certain that all those are done. Um, uh, let's go ahead and create issue one then. So we can uh, change to our issues. So there's six tasks on the second assignment. Go to my feedback pull request um, and let's go ahead and associate task one. So, um, so let me step back. So for assignment two, um, uh, we're gonna be doing a little bit with dynamic memory um, and classes and pointers, okay? so. Um, I, 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 I'd assume that the first assignment should have been mostly completely review, except maybe you did a, a class in didn't use C or C++. So, so you, but, but, you know, learning how to use, uh, reviewing using arrays, writing functions and things like that uh, in a programming language or specifically in C++. So here uh, you may or may not have done stuff with, with classes uh, or dynamic memory allocation. So, um, um, 
So here we're actually going to be building a class called large integer whose the, the purpose of this class is to uh, be able to hold an integer um, bigger than can normally fit. So it, like in, in, in a typed language like C, C++ and many languages, um, we use 32 bits to represent an integer. So that means that there's, there's actually for like a sign integer, it's actually 31 bits plus one bit for the, the plus or minus for the sign. So that gives a maximum. So if you have 31 bits, the maximum value you can represent the magnitude is two to the power of 31, right? Which is pretty big. So that's like what, 2 billion, 147 million, 483,647. Uh, but it might not be big enough for all applications. So lots of scientific applications, you might need integers with larger magnitudes than, than that, right? So a common thing in like Python or other higher level languages is, is to actually create new types that aren't built based on the built-in uh, data types. Like an integer is actually supported by the machine architecture. So there's like 32-bit and 64-bit integer and float representations that are actually supported by hardware. But we can we can build uh, an integer from a class that will represent bigger numbers if we wanted to by by having like an array of the digits, all right. So anyway, um, uh, you know, this kind of background you'll you'll understand that better once you get into it. Um, so the first task uh, is we want to implement a two string member method. Um, so. To me, it's, it's easiest to understand these. Let's go to the tests here. So let's let's start by uncommenting uh, the first test case, which is for task one here. Um, actually, there's not very many tests here. There's only like three assertions. Uh, it saves. So notice again when I hit save, it re-indented everything correctly here. So basically, to string, if I have a a, a um an like instance of a large integer class. Um, I can I can call a member function called to string on my instance, um, and it should return a string representation. Okay, so if I create a string with the digits one two three four five, or an, an, a large integer with the digits one two three four five, and ask it to convert to a string, it should return the string one two three four five. All right, so that's all this is doing here. Um, So in this one, instead of just using regular functions, we're working with a class, the large integer class. Um, and your, um, for all the tasks, your, uh, what you need to do is add in and implement the, the um, described member functions, all right? So um, for this class, we're gonna be keeping an array, we gave you a few, we gave you a constructor and a destructor for this class here. Um, but I'll get you started on the first task. So the two string member method, if we look at these tests, uh, doesn't take any parameters. It's a member of the large integer class. So it doesn't take any parameters as input, but it returns a string as a result, All right? So it looks something like, like that. Right? Um, And um, I wanted to look at the, um, the issues here. Um, yeah, I asked you to use the output string streams for this. Um, and yeah, and this should be a constant member function. So um, calling to string shouldn't modify the, um, um, the instance, so it shouldn't modify any of the values in the instance. So this, again, I talk about these in the um, um, lecture videos here when we go over classes in C++. But what that means is that toString is a constant member function. So you, you um, specify constant member functions using that const keyword again, but you put it after the end of the declaration um, in the header file of, of the function. This could be a constant member function. Right? So again, by adding that, um, if I was to compile after uncommenting my tests here, um, it, it should be fine compiling the test, but uh, we'll have link errors because we haven't actually implemented the two string member function yet, this constant two string member function here. So, um, uh, 
Um, you actually put the implementations like we did before into a .cpp file. So large integer .cpp is where you put the implementations for all of the member functions. Um, I should have given you um, um, documentation for all these. So, so here you have to find the documentation for the two string member function, and you want to put your implementation right after that. Right now, um, you know if you follow the um, uh, if you've gone through the videos for this unit, um, so there's a little bit of extra added syntax that we need. So anything that's a member function of the large integer class, you indicate by putting large integer colon colon in front of it. Okay, so now two string is not just a regular function. This indicates it's a member function of large integer here. All right. Um, so, you know, so to string it returns a string, doesn't take any input parameters. Um, but yeah, here we would have our actual implementation. So, um, um, as usual, you know, we can start with the stub function. This is all I'm going to give you for this one here since we haven't um, actually completed this assignment yet. So, you know, uh, to string is returning string, so I can just stub it out to return like an empty string, right? So that should be enough to compile um, and run. Uh, I won't be able to pass any of the tests. Um, I could get it to pass the first test by stubbing it out to return zero, let's say. Um, so let's try that. So I do a, a, a make clean and then I make. So if I didn't make any mistakes, it should actually be able to compile and link everything together. Again, so now I'm, I'm back to a state where I can actually run my tests. Um, and yeah, the tests run, but you know they're failing. And so it's actually passing this first one because I stubbed it out to return zero. But here, when we expect it to return one, two, three, four, five, um, it's still returning the string zero, all right? Um, All right, so that's kind of going to be all the code that I give you, but um, um, here I'll describe kind of how this works here. So basically, um, for this large integer function, you've got some private member variables. Um, you won't have to do anything with the ID, but the, the, the two you'll work with are the number of digits um, and digit, okay? So, um, as um, um, whenever you call the constructor, um, it's going to um, um, allocate the digits array. So like when you call the constructor um, here for the second one, we call the constructor with the, the integer digits, one, two, three, four, five, it will dynamically allocate a new array called digit um, and it will populate that array with those values, one, two, three, four, five, okay? Um, and as is described in the assignment, um, the least significant digit will be at index zero of the digit array. So five will actually be at index zero, four at index one, and so on, right? So, um, so for this first task, you need to have a loop that pulls the values out of the digit array and create and constructs a string. You want to use an O string stream to do this. Um, so these string streams, again, you know, you might want to either, I talked about these in my lecture videos, but um, just as a quick example, um, you can treat these like uh, C out and C in. So if I have an O string string stream, um, I could output like an integer. So this will actually convert it to a character and output it to my string stream. Uh, now, um, you know, we're returning strings, not O string streams. So, uh, but, but you can, um, um, yeah, you can, re you can convert it to, um, a, um, I'm using the C++ IntelliSense a little bit here. You 
you can convert it to um, a, a regular string by calling the string member method on this O string stream output, right? So I should get the same results I had before, but now I'm using an output string stream instead of a uh, instead of just hard coding returning um, a, um, a fixed string here. So let's try that out. So if you look at, at compiling and running the test, it's still returning a zero like it was before, but now by putting it into this O string stream and then um, converting that to a regular string and returning it again. So anyway, you know, so instead of doing that, you actually have to iterate over the, um, the digits in the digit array, similar to, to, to some stuff that's being done here, but, um, stream those digits into this into an uh, O string stream and then return that as a regular string. Okay. Um, anyway, so that was task one. And then I'm only going to just talk about the other tasks here. Um, so the second task is um, to add another constructor. So for this constructor, so again, it, to me, it's always easiest um, um, to actually look at like the tests here. So let's look at the um, second set of unit tests. I'll just go ahead and uncomment these. So basically, I gave you constructors that can take an integer, but um, for the constructor you do for task two, you pass in an array, or you'll be passed in an array of digits, um, and you have to construct a large integer from this array. So you actually passed in two parameters for this constructor, the size of the array, um, and then the, an array of integers as the second parameter. Okay? So these functions are similar to the functions you did for assignment one, like some of the values we were just working on, things like that, in terms of the parameters that are coming in, but you have to use that to construct you know, you have to use that to initialize the digits array. So your code for your constructor is going to have, it's going to be pretty similar to this code here, um, 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 the constructor I gave you. It's just, for example, you don't have to calculate the number of digits. Uh, you're given the number of digits. So you have two parameters instead of one. Um, the first one is actually the number of digits. Uh, for the array, but then, you know, given the number of digits as your first parameter, you have to dynamically allocate an array of digits to hold the digits like we do here. And then you're going to have to have a loop uh, to copy the values from the, the array you're given a second parameter into this new digit array that you dynamically construct here. So, um, that was task two. Oops. Um, so you're going to create a constructor for task two. You're going to create a max digits member function for task three here. So um, oh yeah, so for this one, there's actually um, a, a test picture you need to uncomment. So you should uncomment that. Uh, and then also uncomment the task three tests here. So uncomment both of those before you start working on task three. So here, you basically, um, you know, we, we, this test fixture, we reuse these large integers that are constructed here uh, in this test fixture. Okay, so like large integer one is an empty large integer with, you know, zero, with one digit of zero in it. Large integer two has a five. So the basic idea is that uh, we're figuring out uh, which one of these two has the most number of digits. So, uh, for example, if you look at large integer three and four, large integer three has one, two, three, four, five digits, um, and oh, large integer four has five digits as well. So let's do, do the next one. So let's look at large integer five and six. So large integer five has one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, has nine digits in it. But large integer six has 17 digits, right? So if you ask which is the maximum number of digits between large integer five and large integer six, the answer is 17. 
Um, so that's what max is just supposed to do. So, so you, yeah, um, 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 you know the number of digits. So if I go back to my large integer class, uh, both of those large integers have a num digits member variable. So you have to just compare those and return the larger of the two for the num digits. Um, and then digit at position works kind of like array indexing. So let's uncomment task four there. So basically, again, let me pick one um, like large integer five here. So large integer five, if you ask for the digit at position six, uh, that's the one at the 10 to the sixth power or the, the millions power, it's supposed to be an eight here. So for example, so large integer five has these digits. Um, sorry, here, it has these digits. So the, the, the one at position six is, so this is position zero, one, two, three, four, five, six, right? So this is the, 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 position six or the millions digit, 10 to the power of six here. So, you know, this 10 to the power of zero, one, two, three, and so on. So that that's what the digit is. It's kind of like indexing in here to find the particular digit at that position with, with some uh, extra things, right? So if you index a negative value, you should return zero, or if you index a value past the n, right? So if I only have, uh, so large integer two only has um, um, one digit. The, the the 10 to the power of zero digit, the one the one's value digit. So so if I ask for the digit at position um, um, five for large integer two, it, it's a zero because that's everything above the most significant digit is a zero um, for this digit at position. So. Um, All right, and then to wrap up task five, um, append digit. Um, let's look at how that works. So given, for example, uh, large integer two, if you go back and look at the test fixture, has a single digit of five on there. So if you append a digit, it actually makes it become the new most significant digit when you call append digit. So appending a seven to large integer two, results in a large integer with the value seven five in it or the two digits seven five in there right so that that's what what a pin digit does here it shouldn't make it the new most significant digit for an existing large integer and then finally i mean the whole purpose of all these previous tasks is we really want this large integer to be able to do things like you know, be able to support arithmetic. So we want to be able to add two large integers together and get the resulting large integer, or subtract them, multiply, divide, all the arithmetic operations. We only do add here just to give you an example of what you could do. So, um, so for example, the test, test six test cases have some examples of, of adding calling the add function so you know l1 and l2 l1 had a zero in there and l2 has 75 in there so if i add zero plus 75 the result that's returned from the add is, is going to be a new large integer that we called large integer result here um, and the result is 75. So there's a description of how to implement this. Uh, basically, you're going to be reusing the append digit and the digit at position and the max digit. So you're going to be reusing most all of these functions, probably use the constructor as well, um, to implement and successfully if you follow the suggested implementation for this. So. Um, all right, so yeah, it's already uh, over an hour here. Uh, there's there was one question, yeah. So um, um, you know, of course, uh, for you guys to see this, um, um, I am recording these videos. It would be better if you do the if you come live if you want want to ask questions um, as you think of them, right? So 
but uh, anyway, uh, all these videos, I will try and record them unless I have technical problems. It's easy to forget uh, or to, to lose these sometimes. So it's another reason to try and catch these live if you can. Uh, but these will all be on YouTube um, and you know, you'll know you find them in the, the, the class playlist for YouTube. Um, all right, yeah, so I'm gonna have to end the session and run here, sorry. Um, um, so I'm gonna go ahead and end the session. Um, and I will see you guys later then.